Welcome back to Spank Ranch Garage. Another night working on this freaking turd. Uh, last episode, we took it for a spin and broke an axle. So I need to understand what happened here to prevent it from happening again. Easy fix, but we need to understand the root cause. All right, so here is the inner CV joint that broke. And this is a pretty stout unit, actually. It's not huge. It's probably like similar to a Type 1 Volkswagen diameter, but it is eight balls and it is a non-plunging type, which allows the highest amount of angle and usually very good strength as well. I mean, this thing's got a lot of wall thickness on it. I expect that this outer cage, pretty damn durable. Inner star, you know, pretty typical, uh, no real damage there. I think that'll take a whooping as well. So the actual point of failure was the cage and the cage broke and allowed a couple of the balls to go walking and then the whole thing comes apart after that. And really we need to understand what made the cage break. So all the pieces are accounted for. The whole puzzle goes back together here pretty easily. And while we're on this topic of CVs, these are these uh, who makes them? Track motive telescoping axles, right? And people wanted to know how they work. Well, basically you've got a cup with six grooves cut in it here, and then you've got this alignment of ball bearings, and this all rides together to give you that telescoping action on the axle. And that's how they're able to get the articulation angles they are advertising on the CVs, because when the CV doesn't have to plunge itself, you can get a lot more angle out of it. Uh, so this uses non-plunging CVs on both the inboard side, the outboard side, and then all of the plunge is accounted for in this center, you know, ball sliding thing. So now I start to develop a theory of what I think happened here. And what I think happened is watching the videos, I mean, driving it, uh, you know, kind of the level of the suspension and everything. When I'm on the throttle and this thing's leaning, these axles are actually pretty straight with the transmission. They've only got a little bit of forward angle. And one thing that I observed when building this is that we are very close to running out of travel on this uh, when we're actually totally straight, right? So uh, the axle is in its longest form right now. It goes shorter, 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 and then longer, longer, longer as travel goes up. There is that sweet spot in the center where we are at our shortest point. And I have it so maybe there was like a quarter inch of actual travel left before that axle bottoms out. And I didn't think too much of it at the time. Now, looking back, you know, we've got a transmission that's rubber mounted. We've got an engine that's rubber mounted. We've got frame and trailing arms that flex. Um, perhaps what may have happened was this axle was pretty well lined up straight and me sliding through the yard, you know, kicking the clutch, doing my thing. This CV came together and bottomed out. And when this part bottoms out, it's going to transmit all of that force going this way into the center star, which in turn is going to try to move the balls where it wants to go. The cage is what retains that. And the cage is blown open sideways. So it's kind of consistent with what could have happened there. So that's just a theory at this point. I don't have a way to prove that, but what we can do is try to give ourselves a little more wiggle room here. All right, so there is a smidge. We do have this, uh, man. And part of that's the transmission moving as well. So we have maybe, three sixteenths of an inch of plunge remaining. My thoughts on that are, you know, with a little bit of deflection in the trailing arm, a little bit of deflection in the motor mounts, I think we could possibly over plunge the axle and break a cage. So that's what I think happened. Now, how do we remedy this? There's going to be compromise for the moment, but this compromise will prove the concept and then we're gonna build a custom set of axles later if this is the issue. But for now, we need to either space the hub out. I have a spacer in here for the splines that I could remove or turn down. Um, I don't wanna change the alignment of the buggy. You could, you could actually tow it 
tow it in and it would pop the trailing arms out, but the alignment's spot on. We don't want to touch that. So I think we are going to uh, play with this hub spacing here. I'd like to see like, man, I think it's safe to see almost a half inch of plunge. And the, I think half inch would make me feel a lot better being that this thing's rubber mounted and everything. Um, but when we have a half inch of plunge in your worst case scenario, you're going to lose a lot of your extension as you drop down. So we're probably going to have to install limiting straps to catch a little bit of our droop so we're not overextending the axle and that will break the cages in just the same manner. That's just not enough. All right, so some playing around. I had a spacer, yay thick. Ended up making thinner ones like that, the bare minimum to make this axle fit this hub. If you remember episodes back, uh, this is from a newer Subaru, this is from an older Subaru, the splines end too short on the axle, yada, yada, yada. But anyway, uh, we have achieved our half inch of action here before bad things happen. Just taking that up, the transmission's not moving, nothing crazy going on there. That should give me that fudge factor that I need to not bottom out the cages that way. Now, you know, every action, there's an opposite reaction. Now we're going to lose a bunch of travel in the droop side. So I wanna see where this thing's gonna bottom out with droop. So fully drooped out, this joint is fully extended and that's actually limiting the down travel of the arm at this point. We are just a smidge off on this. Uh, we're literally like three eighths of an inch from where the shock would allow this to droop to. Looking at this geometry, if I brought this up, even just, that moves this a lot. Like you get a lot of inward travel per per your travel here. It probably wouldn't take much. Um, and I wish I had an accurate way to measure that, but I'll probably just eyeball it. But yeah, we're not losing much. Maybe if I take an inch and a half or two inches of droop out of this setup, I think we're just gonna be in such a happier spot with these axles. And that's still going to allow me pretty damn good suspension travel. Okay, so finally found a happy medium here. It actually was the middle point. And then I went to the forward hole on this for the limiting strap. Looks a little funky, but does the job. So looking here, not sure if you can really tell on camera, but this one's about inch and a half higher. So we've took about an inch and a half of droop out of this. That way that axle is happy at full droop and it's very happy at its lowest or at its shortest point. It's also very happy. Should really help us with these axles if my theory is correct. And this is just to test the theory. None of this really has to be permanent. Uh, we'll see if it holds up better. All right, we're all limit strapped up, painted, shimmed. I'm feeling pretty good about this. I called the dyno guy. He's gonna let us use the dyno for a little while. So let's get this thing loaded up and over to the dyno shop. Really gotta watch out for these fly-by-night tuners and crappy dyno shops. So as expected, this thing is in one type of hellacious limp mode. We pulled 64 horsepower out of her and 101 foot pounds of torque. And it made good torque actually. It made good torque at about 3,200 RPMs here. Uh, only 100 though. Damn it! 
anyway um so yeah basically this thing is just pulling all kinds of throttle and timing i mean it is making 20 horsepower and 20 foot pounds of torque at 5,000 rpms i'd like to see about 140 more horsepower than that or maybe even 100 more horsepower than that would be pretty nice so uh, let's figure out why this thing's in limp mode. I have a couple ideas regarding communication with the TCM, and I think I found a table that's gonna help us get out of this. Uh, there's actually a couple things I need to modify in the ECU to hopefully get around this, but this is a really funny base pull to have. You know, you got all this motor and cool noises, and the thing makes 64 horsepower. So we're trying to run this computer with no transmission controller, obviously, because it's not an automatic anymore. It's a stick shift and no vehicle speed sensor. So a little better of a pull, but still totally wrong. This thing basically does not want to rev out. It seems to make great torque up to 3000. It actually hit, uh, what, like 14 pounds of boost here and then just falls on its face. At this point, the throttle's only half open. It's making four pounds of boost and it's just unhappy. So let's go study this tune, see if we can figure this out. no luck with this thing i've been out here like four hours so now i'm scoping the cam sensor hoping to split that signal and send it to the vehicle speed sensor to make this thing think it's moving and maybe it's in gear but my patience is running thin with this automatic ecu i really got to do something about this i think all right this is a good sign we are reading vehicle speed <laughs> start some more tomfoolery here and make this thing think you know it's directly connected to the wheels oh well, it's got a lot of rev hang now and it's idle and weird i got some more things i need to evaluate but this may allow us to run to redline without all that throttle body modulation so i'll have to see about that <laughs> again with a broken buggy this is a little different this time so first of all um brand new bmw transmission mount or engine mount i'd say blown to pieces exploded so that caused the engine to flip backwards tear the intercooler off the throttle body and break one of my temporary brackets for my shifter but that's okay we will recover uh Sounds like I need a front motor mount and it didn't break any axles, which is really cool. Now we did lose the drivetrain, unfortunately. So I got to limp this thing back. Well, anyway, where I left it on the dyno, it's this last pull here, 78 horsepower, 119 foot pounds of torque. You know, it's got a banger of torque at 3,200 RPMs and then it's just downhill from there. And that's not the way these engines are. Uh, they, they do drop off, but nothing like this. This is a joke. Um, so 
I guess I'm gonna bite the bullet, buy some tools to do some GM flash pre-programming like a dealership would have. And then we'll try to flash that other ECM that way. Hopefully that thing plays nice. There is just too much torque management going on here and it seems to be coming from a source that I can't identify. I'd like to give a special thanks to my brother from Print Practical uh, for letting us use his 2017 Cruze as a test unit for the day. His is a 17, it's an E80A ECU because it's a later 17 and it's factory stick shift. So we were doing a little bit of testing and fooling around here, trying to come up with something that's gonna work for this buggy. We have made some groundbreaking discoveries here. I've been battling this no start without starting fluid issue for over a week now. And finally, no starting fluid. There it is. We can say goodbye to our starting fluid days. Uh, we were able to successively, <clears throat> we were able to successively, successfully. we were able to successfully flash a six speed manual trans operating system to the E80A ECM. So I didn't even have to go back to the E80, uh, luckily, because I wasn't having any luck with that either. She starts right up now, runs good. So got some work to do and then we'll make sure she's making the power she needs to. As I'm getting pretty limited on time here, I don't need a full fab project right now. I am looking to reuse this rear cage half. The bends aren't exactly right, but they're, they'll be close enough. All right, got this piece of crap on, just four bolts, easy on, easy off. It's something to add a little protection. It's not, you know, breaking this when it was only making like 70 horsepower is not very, not very confidence inspiring to me. I do have some solid mounts that I built for another car that'll bolt right in, so I will be bringing them with if this thing wants to cause a problem. GM did have a front mount on this engine, which went something like that, um, but that ain't gonna clear this little cross member here. This thing isn't the strongest, but it'll offer enough support to take a lot of load off the middle and rear mounts. So here's a solid motor mount I have. Probably come in here and there, bring something out. mount didn't turn out too ugly but all three eighths plate one inch steel should be pretty stiff it'll do the job it's only mounted to a one inch cross member so probably the cross member will flex before this does and that's okay because uh, i will be running that solid mount up front i think it'll provide me good rigidity Couple late night thoughts before i call it a night here so we still need a bolt check i know there's some motor mount stuff that's loose in the back Need to get Mrs. Spanky's seat and harness mounted. I gotta finish welding the front side of the shifter up in the uh, passenger compartment there. I'm gonna swap to a three quarter inch brake master cylinder. The one that's in there is just a little too, a little too stiff for the pedal ratio. Put the front sheet metal back on, wire up the mass airflow sensor permanently. That's kind of a temporary setup now. Maybe get it back on the dyno for a tune. And does the vehicle speed sensor need to be faked out for this or not? That's all TBD get my spare parts program ready for this trip. I'd like to fabricate tree kickers uh, to keep those back wheels on if I slide into something. Get my ammo boxes mounted like I had there before for spare parts and tools on the trail and then I need to drink more beer. So I'll probably do this, I'll start with this and then I'll do all of this tomorrow hopefully. Chipping away at my list and then some. One of the things I forgot was 
tightening up this shift mechanism. So if you remember the last episode, this was really sloppy. I welded a piece on here, built basically a clamp with a gap, and now there's absolutely no play in the shifter. Shifter feels sweet. Shifter is complete. Full brackets welded in, everything's painted. Seat mounts are done. I have swapped the old 7 8 master cylinder for a three quarter. That should give me a little more line pressure. Sheet metal's on, steering's buttoned up. Seats are in. I mount these things stupid solid. So you are just bolted to this frame as you're riding, which is a nice feeling. Uh, so I guess it's bolt check time and some more wiring and we are getting damn close here. Here we are again, an awfully similar situation here. Broken bearing cage, broken CV cage. Now this time I was actually out on the road, spooled first up, grabbed second pretty hard and it just exploded. So we do have a strength issue here, though I have been really beating on this thing uh, pretty hard today off road and it's been holding up. So now I'm down to just no spare axles. This is a little hairy uh, going into a trip this way, but you know, we gotta find these limits really. So oh, there's no better place than here to simulate a trail repair. Obviously I won't have an impact gun with me, but I will have a ratchet. She's a rider, it's ready. Uh, I'd like to get my ammo boxes mounted and get the tree kickers built, but that's kind of optional. Uh, otherwise, seems reliable, seems to make good power. Not even gonna dyno it, cause it makes enough power to break axles on command. So we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna cry over a couple horsepower. Uh, I am so relieved the starting thing is fixed. Just feels great. I mean, now with all this power and good brakes, you really start to feel the lack of a stock steering box uh, link pin front end, so that'll be down the road. But as of now, this is something I can take out on the trails and go enjoy. I just need to demonstrate a little bit of self-control to keep these axles alive, so. Another thing I did do was drop the nitrogen in the rear shocks to 350 pounds. That lowered my ride height quite a bit. It actually rides level now and matches the front. Uh, still has about 12 inches of ground clearance to those tubes, a little more to the engine and trans. I'm going to bring my bottle with me in case I need to bump it up, but I'm figuring sitting a little lower, a one, it's going to ride really nice. If I'm not hitting anything big, and two, it's going to give these axles just a smidge more 
chance at life or a longer life. All right, guys, that wraps another one up here with this damn buggy. Uh, we're finally going to ride it, so we made it. We did something here. Um, I'm not 100% pleased with everything. We still got some things to work out, mainly the axles and maybe some of the engine tuning. But we're a hell of a lot closer than we've ever been. So tomorrow we hit the road. Could be in West Virginia for four or five days. Not all of that will be riding. Uh, I've got a lot of other things I need to do while I'm there, but I do hope to ride for a day or two. Put some miles on this thing and see how we enjoy it. And then I'm sure once I come back from there, I'll have a list of things that need to be done to really make this what I want it to be. But you gotta start somewhere. So thanks for watching Spank Ranch Garage. Let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you soon.